Okay, we'll be continuing our Sutta study program. So we've been going through the Dhammapada over the past few weeks. We've been going through each chapter of the Dhammapada. Uh, so some of you have this document. Uh, so if you have it in front of you, please follow along. If you don't have a copy of the text, um, please listen closely to make sure you're not missing anything. Um, and if in the future you want to copy the text, send us an email before the class and we'll uh, email you a copy so you have it on hand. So, uh, the chapter we're currently on is the Bala Vaka, which is the, the fool chapter, the chapter about fools. So hopefully this isn't describing any of us in the room. Um, we'll find out soon enough if we qualify or not. Um, unfortunately, most of us probably fit this category, including myself. In fact, probably every single one of us. Um, because the truth is that uh, the only person who's not a fool is an enlightened being. Uh, the rest of us are deluded to one extent or another. The rest of us have some degree of misunderstanding or misperception of the nature of reality. Uh, or else we would be enlightened by definition. Um, so most of us are still fools to one extent or another. Though hopefully we're also trying to diminish our foolishness. So this chapter then gives us a few concrete ways to approach uh, just what is the nature of a fool, so that we know what to steer away from at the minimum. So the first verse in this, so this is uh, Dhammapada verse 60. Um, and um, on this occasion I included the Pali text of each of the verses. Uh, would people like me to recite the Pali before I talk about the meaning of things? Is that of interest? Yes, I see some nodding. Great. So, Dhammapada verse 60 says, Digha jagarato rati, dighang santasa yojanam, digho balanang samsaro, sadhammang avijanatam. And the translation here says, Long is the night for one who cannot sleep. Long is a mile for one who is exhausted. Long is samsara for fools, those who do not understand the true Dhamma. So uh, the first two are uh, simple similes. So long is the night for one who cannot sleep. Who here has ever had insomnia for any amount of time? I've definitely experienced it from time to time, so, though not recently, fortunately. Um, yeah, and when you're just lying in bed and you can't sleep for eight hours, uh, it feels interminable. Um, or long as a mile for one who's exhausted. So I went on a very long walk today. And you get to a point where you just feel you can't possibly take another step. And that's no big deal if you can just get in a car or get on a train and go the rest of the way. But when you know you still have to walk another mile, when you feel like you can barely take a single step, that mile seems impossibly long. Um, so similarly, long is samsara for fools who do not understand the true Dhamma. So what do we mean by samsara? So samsara is the, uh, the cycle of continued existence. It's the cycle of delusional existence. It's the cycle of perceived self-existence. Um, so uh, in Buddhism, we say that the root cause of all suffering, so even more foundational than desire, Normally we say the root cause of all suffering is desire. But what's the root cause of desire? The root cause of desire is the delusion of self-existence. The delusion, I exist as an individual. I am. I really exist. This is me. Right here. I exist. And uh, so it's not that nothing exists. That's a misperception as well. But rather it's that there is nothing which is absolutely me. There is nothing which is ultimately mine or myself. There's nothing that I can absolutely say is, is what I am. Um, so when we have that perception of, uh, of self-identity, that perception of I am, I exist, this is me, then we're caught in this ongoing cycle of wandering through different states of I am, different forms of I am different states of individual existence. So, assuming that there's no enlightened beings in this room, every single one of us is experiencing one particular form of individual existence, one particular 
uh, way of experiencing the world as an individual. And as you may have noticed by now, it kind of sucks. It's not particularly pleasant much of the time. Like right now, I've got a bit of a stomach ache. So, well, I mean, that's life. I frequently have stomach aches. It's just part of the nature of this particular body. But the reason why that's an issue is because I identify with this body. I think this body is me. This body is mine. Therefore, the pain in this body's stomach is extremely personal. It affects me very strongly. Maybe not as strongly as it would have 10 or 15 years ago, before I started, um, started practice 15 years ago. But it still affects me. Uh, so there's still some sense of self-attachment, some sense of self-identity wrapped up in this body. So therefore, it's painful, it's unpleasant. So the overall characteristic of samsara, of uh, existing as an apparent individual, is that it's unpleasant, it's unsatisfying. Um, so we're, we're again, it's it's like uh, it's like that night of insomnia. It just seems to go on and on forever, and it's just unpleasant every step of the way. It has its moments of diminished unpleasantness and its moments of intense unpleasantness. But its overall character is that it seems interminable, uh, and it's always somewhat unpleasant. So that's the nature of samsara, uh, when we don't understand Dhamma, when we don't understand the, the path to enlightenment. It seems interminable and unpleasant. So that's the plight of most beings, actually, most people, uh, whether they're human or non-human. That's the, the plight that most beings are in. So then we start to develop an understanding of Dhamma. Uh, so the, the term sad dhamma, uh, that can mean either true Dhamma, as translated here, or the good Dhamma. Um, so the, the Dhamma that is good, the Dhamma that is beneficial, that brings true benefit. Um, and also the true Dhamma, in a sense, that which accurately describes reality. So this is important to distinguish because the term Dhamma or Dharma is often used in a much more nebulous sense to mean any teaching or any concept, uh, or even any phenomenon. So we could talk about, uh, say, Hindu Dharma as being distinctly different from Buddha Dharma. Uh, or, uh, so it's uh, just distinguishing. So when we say the Sad Dhamma, the true Dhamma, the, the, the good Dhamma, we're talking about teachings that accurately describe the way things are, and that bring genuine benefit to those who follow them, those who practice them. So as we start to develop some understanding of the Dhamma, then we start to realize that samsara is not interminable. There is an alternative. It is possible to attain enlightenment. It is possible to break free of the cycle of ongoing, unpleasant, uh, distorted existence. There is another way. So that changes things. So it's like the insomniac who realizes that they actually can fall asleep. It really is an option. Uh, or, or the person on a journey who realizes that uh, it will come to an end. It's not going to last forever. But it does come to an end at some point. So similarly, as we start to understand the Dhamma, then we realize that there is an end to samsara. There is a, a escape. Uh, there is a... Uh, a source of, of freedom and joy, which is uh, breaking out of this ongoing cycle of misperceived self-existence. Um, so in this case, then, fool, we can take the, the definition of fool here in uh, different ways. The simplest one is someone who simply has no understanding at all of Dhamma, no understanding at all of the teachings that lead to enlightenment. Um, in that sense, most of us in this room are not fools, because at the bare minimum, um, hopefully there's some understanding of just what I've said in the last few minutes, which is a step in the right direction. Hopefully, most of us, and in fact, looking around the room, most of us already have been studying and practicing Buddhism for some time. So hopefully we already have a fair body of knowledge about what the Buddhist teachings are, and how we can use them to free ourselves from this ongoing cycle of self-torment. So in that sense, we're not fools, in that we are, we do have some understanding of the true Dhamma, the good Dhamma. But in another sense, we still are fools because we don't completely understand it. We have not yet reached enlightenment. We still are clinging to 
some of our misperceptions. We're still clinging to our desires. We're still clinging to our, our pet hatreds. Uh, we're still clinging to our uh, comfortable delusions. To our, and, and, and at its uh, deepest level, we're still clinging to the delusion of self-existence. We're clinging to self. We're clinging to me. The one thing that we most cherish above all else, which is ourself, we still hold very tightly to it without realizing that it is that grasping itself that's causing us so much pain in the first place. That all we have to do is just drop that self-identity and the whole problem resolves itself instantaneously. So to that extent, we're still in the domain of tools. So again, depending on which layer we approach, it's either hopeful or maybe not so hopeful. Um, but as long as we continue to work on deepening our understanding and strengthening our practice, then we'll keep moving in the direction of, of true understanding, of genuine understanding. So next, Dhammapada verse 61. Uh, this one says, Charanche na digacheya se yang sadisamatano e kacharyang dalhang kayira natibale sahayata. If you cannot find a traveling companion who is superior or equal to yourself, then resolutely travel alone. There is no value in companionship with fools. Um, so here the Buddha's. Uh, actually already assuming that we're not fools, which is encouraging. Uh, <laughs> <he's> a, <laughs> um, and, and there's also a very important message here, which is considering uh, not just your traveling companions, but also all of your companions. Who do you spend your time with? Who do you associate with? And how are they approaching life? Are they approaching life through the mind of a fool? Uh, the mind of someone who is obsessed with sensual desire, obsessed with sensuality, uh, someone who's obsessed with their prejudices, their hatred, their discrimination. Um, so we've seen some very disgusting examples of that in the news recently. Um, or uh, someone who's very, very obsessed with himself. Uh, again, we've seen some lovely examples of that in the news recently. <laughs> um, or, and, and if they are, then considering how is my association with these, these foolish people, how is it affecting me? Is it rubbing off on me? Is it having a, a negative impact on me? Because often it does. Even when we think, uh, even when we think that we've, we've built up a, an internal shelter for ourselves, internal protection, um, if you're constantly hanging out with people who are prone to uh, desire and diversion and delusion, you'll find that you tend to start acting in similar ways. Um, you're hanging out with them and they're just like, oh, I really hate this, this sucks so bad. And you're just like, you know, you're right, I really hate this too, it really is awful. And then before you know it, you're back in your old patterns of hating things. Uh, your friend is like, come on, let's go get some drinks, you know, you can forget about those precepts, they're really not important. Absolute reality, that's what really matters, no precepts and absolute reality. And you're like, come on, let's be real. And they're like, come on, one won't hurt. Well, what's going on there, once again? Uh, by hanging out with fools, we start to adopt their foolish behaviors, their foolish ways. And also, it makes it much more difficult for us to work on our own minds. Um, so if we're hanging out with people who have no interest in spiritual practice, then they won't respect our path, and they definitely will not support our path. Uh, instead, they're much more likely to subtly or overtly uh, try to persuade us to uh, drop our practice, to diminish our interest in our practice. So the Buddha says, uh, if you can't find someone who is either better than or equal to yourself, and that's better or equal in terms of spiritual practice. Uh, so that's always the, the guideline. Is this person either uh, more enlightened than me, or at least on a similar plane? Are they either more committed to practice than me, or at least on a similar degree of commitment? Uh, and if not, then really questioning, what is my companionship with this person? Is it really worth continuing? Uh, or is it worth reevaluating? So again, the Buddha says it's better to be alone 
than to be with someone who's dragging you down. It's better to be alone than to be with someone who's damaging your practice. Next, Dhammapada verse 62. Puttamati dhanamati etibalo vehanyati attahi attano nati kuto putta kuto dhanam. A fool is tormented by thoughts of children and wealth. When one does not even possess oneself, how could one possess children and wealth? Um, so this is also pointing a bit to the meditation that we just did, reflecting that we don't even own our own body. Like what we think of as our own body is not our own. It's not us. It's just part of the natural world. It's just the same dirt, water, heat, and air that makes up everything else. There's nothing special about it. We think it's special because we think it's ours. We think it's special because we think it's, it's who we are. But it's not. It's not special at all. It's just, it's just like the trees and the dirt and the waters and the oceans and all that. It's all the same. Uh, there's nothing unique about it. And we don't own any of it. None of it belongs to us. So when we don't even own our own body, how much more senseless is it to think we own anything else and to get so caught up and obsessed with it like, oh, I don't have enough money, I need more money. Oh, my kids aren't behaving the way I want them to. Oh, I don't even have any kids. Well, whatever it is, it's just like, well, why am I making myself so upset about this? Why am I getting so worked up around this sense of possessiveness when I am incapable of possessing anything? So instead we relax. We look at that sense of possessiveness. And it's just like, oh, I know you. Possessiveness. It's that thing I do to make myself miserable. Maybe I should drop this possessiveness thing. Maybe I should stop tormenting myself with thoughts of possessiveness. So children and wealth, there's nothing inherently evil about children and wealth. Um, but there are examples of things that people commonly get uh, irrationally possessive towards. Um, so it, it's one area of investigation to look at. Uh, but really the point that the Buddha is making here is the attitude of possessiveness in general. Where do we get caught up in that sense of ownership, that sense of, this is mine, this belongs to me. And when we see that, just noticing how we are generating our own discomfort out of a delusion, out of a misperception, a misunderstanding. So we don't own anything. Uh, one simile the Buddha uses is of a, a servant, a servant to a rich person. And the rich person goes uh, out of town for a while. And while the rich person is gone, then the servant goes and takes the, the wealthy person's clothes and takes his chariot and puts on his jewelry and, and starts like going around town in the chariot like, oh, look how wealthy I am, I'm so fabulous, look at me. And then the wealthy person comes back into town and the servant has to take off the clothes and take off the jewelry and put everything back. And so the, the simile here is that uh, we don't own anything. It's just like borrowed goods. We're just borrowing this stuff. It doesn't belong to us. Uh, it's just on loan. Uh, so there's no sense in having any sense of possessiveness towards it because any moment now, uh, the guy in charge is going to come back and take things away. Of course, in Buddhism, there's no guy in charge. <laughs> the point is that we never owned any of this stuff in the first place. Nobody owns it. It's just the universe. Nobody owns the universe. It's just the way things are. It's just what is. So working on putting down that sense of possessiveness, because all it does is make us unhappy. Next, Dhammapada verse 63. Yo valo manyati balyam pandito vapite naso, valo cha panditamani, save valo te vuchati. A fool who thinks he is foolish is wise in that regard. But a fool who thinks he is wise can truly be called foolish. Um, so this is a very commonly quoted verse from the Dhammapada. So who here has heard this verse before? A few people. That's good. Um, so, yeah, it is, it's just very cute. So at least be aware. Be aware. Oh, I actually don't perceive the universe accurately. 
I'm actually still caught in self-delusion. I'm actually still caught in the illusion of satisfactoriness, the illusion that happiness can be found in the outside world. I'm still caught in the delusion that it's okay to hate things or to hate people. Um, I'm still caught in the delusion of self-existence. I'm still caught in the delusion of permanence. So just recognizing our own foolishness. And you can have a laugh about it, like, oh, that's funny and cool. But at least acknowledge it. And don't, don't, uh, don't form a self-identity around it, like thinking, I am a fool, I will always be a fool, this is just the way things are. So if we, get, if we crystallize a self-identity around our foolishness, that's not helpful either, because then we think we can't change. Um, and it just becomes another brick in the wall of suffering that we're building. But just being aware, being aware of our limitations, and again, you can laugh about it. It's like, oh, well, that's so funny, that's so cute, I'm a dork. But be aware that um, this is ultimately not a good thing, it's something that we need to work on changing. Uh, if we want to be truly happy, if we want to be truly free. Um, the danger is when we think we're wise, when we're not. We think, I've got it all figured out. I really understand. There's nothing more I need to learn. I've got it all figured out. There's the problem, because that's when we lose the ability to learn. When we think we've got it all figured out, we stop trying to understand. Uh, we rest our laurels on wherever we are, on whatever limited perception we have. So there's one discourse where the Buddha describes his own practice leading towards enlightenment. There's actually many discourses where he describes his practice. Um, but there's one in particular where he talks about how he would reach a particular uh, attainment, a certain degree of concentration or a certain degree of understanding. And he would look at it and he'd be like, wow, this is actually really good. Feels great, mind is sharp and clear, there's a lot of bliss and joy. But it's not yet the absolute. It's not yet the ultimate. It's a little bit short. If I were to rest here when there's still more to be done, I would not be achieving my true goal. I would be giving up when there was still something further to be attained. So then he would continue on. He would continue pressing farther. So similarly, not to be content with whatever degree of knowledge or wisdom we've developed, but to keep pressing onward. Keep strengthening our knowledge. Keep deepening our wisdom. So both intellectually, through study of the discourses and the teachings of uh, contemporary Buddhist masters, um, and also experientially, through developing uh, concentration and insight. So really working to internalize the teachings. So, next, Dhammapada verse 64. Yavati vampiche valo panditang payur pasati naso dhammang vajanati dabbi suparasang yata. Even if a fool spends his whole life attending to the wise, he does not understand the Dhamma, like a spoon never knows the flavor of soup. So this is a, a cute metaphor that the Buddha uses in a, a handful of places. So if a spoon is immersed in a pot of soup, does the spoon ever know what the soup tastes like? It can't. A spoon is incapable of tasting things. So similarly, if uh, if we're foolish, so if we're unwilling to deeply examine the true nature of things, um, then even if we're hanging out with people who are speaking the most profound Dhamma, even if we spend time uh, reading Buddhist books, but we're just reading it like a novel, like something entertaining, or we're just reading it like a textbook, as some body of knowledge about some weird stuff that they used to do in Asia somewhere, um, if we're just approaching it with this very superficial mindset, or if we're not interested at all, um, then we won't understand it at all. We won't gain any benefit from it. Um, similarly, even if, we, even if we develop some intellectual idea of Buddhist practice, but we make no attempt to live in accordance with it, then also then we're like the spoon in the soup, immersed in the Dhamma but getting no benefit from it. So the next verse comes right along with that one, so Dhammapada verse 65. Muhutam piche vinyu panditang payuru pasati 
Kipang Kamang Vijanati Jivha Surupa Rasang Yata. Even if a wise person spends only a short time attending to the wise, he quickly understands the Dhamma like a tongue knows the flavor of soup. Um, I should apologize, by the way, for using masculine gender pronouns. Um, I tried to do this using gender neutral pronouns and it just felt too awkward. So I'm sorry, the English language does not accord gender neutral pronouns very easily. Um, so when you're reading through this, when you see a masculine pronoun, feel free to switch it in your mind to whatever you like to switch it to. But just be aware it's not meant to specify any particular gender. But anyway, so this is the counterpart to the previous verse. Um, so when we are committed to developing a deeper understanding uh, of the true nature of things, when we're really committed to understanding the Dhamma and practicing in accordance with the Dhamma, um, that's what it means to be wise uh, in this context. So then as we spend time around people who are uh, both knowledgeable of the, the Buddhist teachings and also well-practiced in them, as we spend time around them and listen to them and make a genuine effort to understand them, then naturally our understanding will progress. Uh, and if we really commit our mind to understanding what's being said and to practicing it, to perceiving it, to living it, to experiencing it personally, uh, then we can quickly come to some degree of understanding of it. Uh, so again, just as when you take a spoonful of soup and you put it in your mouth, you immediately know the flavor of it. It doesn't take any time. Um, in the same way, when we uh, hear the Dhamma, reflect deeply on it, and try to live it, try to perceive it, then we start to get a sense of its flavor, we start to perceive its flavor. So, next, Dhammapada verse 66. Charanti bala dhumme dha amete deva attana karanta papakam kammang yang ho dikatuka balam. Foolish, unwise people act as their own enemies, performing harmful deeds that yield bitter fruit. <coughs> Um, so, this is pointing to the nature of karma. Uh, so, one of the basic principles of Buddhist thought is that every single choice we make, whether it's physical or mental, ultimately produces a corresponding result that we experience. Um, so, a simple principle. Um, every action has a corresponding result. And it's not always immediate. It can sometimes be delayed by minutes, years, lifetimes. Um, so it's not always immediate. In fact, usually it's not immediate. But the result always comes, and the result is always in accordance with what we've done. Um, so very simple principle. Uh, do good things, get good results. Do bad things, get bad results. Um, in broader terms, uh, whatever you do produces a corresponding result. Um, so actually, whether we determine it good or bad is a matter of perspective. Uh, but speaking in terms of good and bad is a bit more straightforward. It's a bit easier to get a handle on. So when we are foolish and unwise, then we tend to act in harmful ways. Ways that are harmful to others, which ultimately is also harmful to, harmful to ourselves. Uh, if we hurt others, then that is an action that results in us being harmed either immediately or at some undetermined point in the future. Um, it's also immediately harmful to ourselves in that uh, watch very closely the next time you do something cruel or unkind. Watch very closely how you feel, how your mind feels, and you'll notice it's immediately unpleasant. You don't actually have to wait any amount of time. You'll immediately notice you're experiencing some discomfort or suffering as a result. And then also at some point in the future, it'll come back to you. Uh, and you'll experience quite a deal of, of uh, misery as a result of what you've done. So then this is the nature of the fool. Uh, the fool does harmful deeds, uh, unwholesome actions, that then later lead to uh, their own damage. Um, so, so again, the, the simile that we use is acting as one's own enemy. So don't be your own enemy, be your own friend. And the best way to be your own friend is to 
Always act in ways that are beneficial to everyone involved. Always considering, how can I act in the way that brings the most benefit both to myself and to others? So not making that distinction of self and other, but always considering, what's of the most benefit? Next, Dhammapada, verse 67. Natang kamang katang sadhu, yang katva anutapati, yasa asamuko rodang, vipakang pratisevati. It is not good to perform an action which one will later regret. When weeping with tearful face, one experiences its result. Um, so similarly, talking about karma, um, noting that whenever we perform any kind of unwholesome deed, so any action based upon greed, hatred, or delusion, then inevitably that produces harmful results for us. Um, and at that time, we'll be quite unhappy about what's, what we're experiencing or undergoing. Um, so a very simple example. Um, in the, there's a couple of discourses in the Vajra Nikaya, the Mahakamavibhanga Sutta and the Shulakamavibhanga Sutta, where the Buddha gives some very concrete examples of karma. Um, so one example is somebody who frequently injures other living beings, whether human or non-human, uh, will experience a lot of illnesses and afflictions. So either in this life or in future lives. They'll get sick a lot, they'll have a lot of physical problems, they'll have a lot of uh, health conditions um, as a direct result of the harm they've done to the health of others. So that's a very simple example. And, of course, karma in its uh, workings out is often a lot more complicated. It's a lot more difficult to map so precisely. But that gives us a sense of the overall principles. Dhammapada, verse 68. Tantra kamman katan sadhu yang katva nanutapati yasapati to sumano vipakang patisevati It is good to perform an action which one will not later regret. When pleased and elated, one experiences its result. So this is the counterpart to the previous discourse, uh, the previous uh, sutta, uh, the previous verse. Uh, so uh, again, just the flip side, considering what can I do that brings positive results? Again, it's always in accord. So act in kind, compassionate, generous, supportive, friendly, respectful ways. Uh, and you'll find that your own life goes very smoothly. Uh, and you'll find that you always come, up, come across pleasant conditions. Maybe not immediately, because we also have all the things we've done in the past. Um, so even in this lifetime, we can no doubt remember having done many harmful things. But also in previous lives, we've done an enormous amount of harmful deeds. So we still will experience the results of those past choices. But if from this moment onwards, we only do good deeds, we only act in beneficial ways, then that starts to shift the character of our lives. It shifts it in the direction of that which is pleasant, that which is enjoyable. And we can also start to cultivate the qualities that lead towards mental clarity and wisdom. So working to develop our own understanding and also to help others develop a clear understanding. That also then is extremely important because that's not just karma in uh, the simple sense of pleasant and unpleasant experiences. But it's the karma that leads to true understanding. It's the karma that leads to, uh, to freedom from suffering. It's the karma that leads to enlightenment. Um, so even if we think that we can't attain enlightenment in this life, by the way, you can. Every single one in this room. All of us can attain enlightenment in this life. So don't think you can't do it this time around. You can. It's not easy, but it can be done. It's a very important point to remember. Um, but at the very least, work on establishing the conditions that lead to mental clarity and that lead to the development of wisdom. So both through developing our own uh, clarity and understanding and also helping others to develop clarity and understanding. One example of this is not using intoxicants and encouraging other people to not use intoxicants. This is a really important aspect of Buddhist practice. It really cannot be overemphasized, um, particularly because it's such a pervasive idea in human cultures that it's okay to be intoxicated. It's not. It is extremely disruptive to your spiritual practice. Not recommended. 
Next, Dhammapada, verse 69. Madhuva manyati balo yava papang napachati yada chapachati papang balo dukkang nigachati. A fool thinks it is sweet as long as he is not tormented by his harmful deed. But when he is tormented by it, the fool descends into suffering. So, uh, madhu literally means honey. Um, translated here as sweet in order to preserve the essence of the meaning. Um, also, the verb pachati, which is translated here as tormented. So, pachati literally means uh, to cook. So this has both the meaning of to uh, burn or sear something. So that's used in a, a general sense to mean torture. It's also used in a very literal sense, like to cook food. Um, and it's also used to mean uh, like bringing something to fulfillment, like bringing something to its final, ready, complete state. So another way of approaching this is rather than saying, as long as one is not tormented by one's deed, saying as long as one's deed is not reached its fulfillment, reached its, its full readiness, its conclusion, its final state. Um, so that's also pointing to the fact that uh, when we make a choice, whenever we do any kind of intentional action, um, and we're doing them every moment, by the way, but every time we do an intentional action, that's not the end of the story. That's the beginning of the story. So we notice the immediate effects of that action. So, for example, you decide, um, I'm going to slap Dave Champ. So, this is an unwholesome decision already. So, it's a mental decision based on, let's say, hatred. I actually don't hate him. I love him. He's awesome. But, so, so this, this feeling of hatred arises. The decision to be violent is made. This is all unwholesome. I actually go ahead and slap Dave Chan. Uh, no idea why, but I go ahead and slap Dave Chan. So, this is all decidedly unwholesome. Um, immediate result, Dave Chan looks upset and maybe hurt and possibly even angry. Um, my hand stings a little bit. So that's immediate result. This is just the beginning of the story. What I've done is I've created the conditions for me to be physically assaulted in the future. I've created the conditions for me to be uh, hurt physically and emotionally in the future. So the immediate effects are visible, but I've set that momentum going. And at some point, I'll experience the rest of that momentum. And at that point, then the story's done. But for now, it's not complete. Now it's just the point of like, yes, I slapped him. I am so awesome. But then at some point it comes back to me, and now I'm the person who's getting slapped. I'm the person who's in pain. I'm the person who feels upset and disturbed. Now the story is complete, and that's when I descend into suffering. That's when I'm tormented by the choice that I made. That's when I'm tormented by the chain of events that I set in motion. So that's what this verse is talking about. Dhammapada verse 70. Mase mase kusagena balo bunje yabhojanam naso sankat dhammanam kalang aghati so lasing. Month after month, the fool might eat using the tip of a blade of grass, but compared to those who comprehend the Dhamma, he still would not amount to even a sixteenth of their value. So, this is a reference to ascetic practices. Um, so particularly at the time of the Buddha in ancient India, uh, and even to this day in, in India and also in many parts of the world, there was a very strong practice, a uh, very strong tradition of ascetic practices, of uh, extreme austerities. So various forms of inflicting pain on yourself um, with the idea that inflicting pain on yourself would somehow develop spiritual understanding, somehow help you purify your body and mind so that you would be able to attain enlightenment. And the, the Buddha authority rejected this. The Buddha very clearly states all throughout the suttas that intentionally hurting yourself is completely useless, total waste of time. Now, renunciation is useful as a means of developing non-attachment, but just hurting yourself is not useful. Uh, so many of these practices were around food. So not eating certain kinds of food, or eating in only very particular or precise ways, or eating extremely tiny quantities. Um, so he gives one example here of eating using the tip of a blade of grass. Um, some translators render this as um, eating only what fits on the tip of a blade of grass, which is 
an extrapolation. That's not, uh, that's not actually what it says in the text. That's extrapolating from the text. But either way, it's pointing to a practice of, uh, of eating in a very unnatural way, of eating in an extremely minimalist way, of trying, trying to eat very tiny amounts. Um, and so the Buddha's point is that that's not going to do you any good. Uh, it's much better to eat normally and work on studying and practicing the Dhamma. That's far more valuable than just engaging in severe self-torture, engaging in severe asceticism. Dhammapada verse 71. Nehipa phang katang kamang saju kirang va mochati da hantang va laman ve di bas ma chano va an evil deed once done is not released suddenly like milk. It follows the fool smoldering like fire concealed by ash. Has anybody seen a cow or a goat or something being milked? I have. Um, so the moment someone goes and squeezes the udder, immediately the milk gushes out. Like there's no delay. It's, it's virtually instantaneous. The moment you go for it, the milk comes out. Um, so... The, the Buddha is indicating here, uh, as I was speaking earlier about karma, the results of karma are usually not immediately complete. There's an, there, there is some kind of immediate result. So again, when I slap Dave Chan, there's an immediate reaction. There's an immediate result. But that's not the end of the story. There's still the, the karmic momentum that's been created by that choice, which stays with me until the time when it's completely burned itself out, until the time when... I've completely experienced all the consequences of that choice that I've made. So the simile the Buddha uses here is like a smoldering fire concealed by ash. So similarly, who here has seen like a fire burn down until there's just these red hot coals covered with a thin layer of gray ashes? You might see this in a campfire or in a fireplace, okay, a few people. But all you have to do is just blow away that ash and the coals flare up. And it's immediately clear that the fire is not out. It's still very much present. So then we carry our karma with us. It's never anywhere other than right here. So people sometimes ask, how can karma come back and find you later? Like if there's no lasting self, how can your karma like go off somewhere else and then come back and find you? And the truth is your karma doesn't need to find you because it's never anywhere else. It's always right here. It's always with us. Uh, karma, uh, in a technical sense, karma is part of the aggregate of consciousness. Uh, so it's, it's part of the, the mental components of being. Uh, so it's literally like every time we make a choice, we are adding components to our consciousness. We're adding components to our non-physical being. And then every time we experience a result, then that aspect of our consciousness melts away, dissipates. So it's expressed as result. So it's like, uh, oh, what do they call it? Potential energy in physics? I, I really should not use physics analogies because it's been too long. Um, but they, they talk about, yeah, what is it? Like when you have like potential energy stored in a spring or something, it's like you compress a spring and you say there's potential for energy, but it's not present. And then you release it and there's actual energy. Anyway, I can't remember the technical yeah, term. Okay, anyway, um, once again, I will not use physics analogies because I can't remember the terms. But the, the point here, once again, is that uh, coming back to the simile he uses of like that, that smoldering fire, we're carrying it with us. So then also, what does it feel like when you've got a burning hot coal next to your body? It's actually unpleasant all along. It's burning you all along. So it's always unpleasant. It's always needling at your mind. So you can also feel that in the ongoing regret and remorse. Um, so even if we justify what you've done, like I can think of times when I did harmful things, not recently, fortunately, but many, many years ago, I did harmful things. And at the time I justified it, like, oh, I was right in doing that. It was, uh, I was acting out of righteous anger. It was, uh, I was, it was my right and it was appropriate. But on some level in my mind, I, I felt kind of sick about it. It was kind of like, that actually wasn't great. I shouldn't have hurt that person. And then as time goes by, it's still there. It's like, oh, I 
Maybe I shouldn't have done that. That really wasn't appropriate. That wasn't right. So it's, it's that constant sense of burning in the mind. So the burning of our own regret and remorse over what we've done. That awareness that we've done something harmful continues to stay with us and burn us. Until finally it burns out completely. Um, once we've experienced uh, torment in accordance with what we've done, uh, then the cycle is complete and it's over. So that is actually one useful thing, by the way. So often when we experience unpleasant or painful circumstances, uh, we can sometimes tend to get caught up in uh, the sense of woe, of like, oh, this is so awful, I'm experiencing these horrible things, and it's so unfair and unjust and blah, blah, blah. Well, one, it's not unfair and it's not unjust. It's the result of our karma. And two, every time we experience something unpleasant, we've just burned up some of our bad karma. Some of our bad karma just got used up. So there's that much less that we have to go through in the future. So then you can take joy when we experience unpleasant things, particularly when it seems out of the blue. It's like, oh, that's great. That's one more chunk of bad karma that I don't have to worry about. <laughs> so as long as I keep producing good karma, then at some point all the bad karma will be used up, burned up. So you can take some joy when bad stuff happens to you. Next, uh, Dhammapada verse 72. Yavadeva anattaya nyattang bala sajayati hanti bala sasukang sang mudhamasa vipadiyam. It leads only to harm the knowledge of a fool, damaging the fool's good side and destroying his head. So, what this is pointing to, so the term knowledge here is not to be misunderstood as being the same as true knowledge or true understanding. Rather, it's a limited knowledge, like the knowledge, if I steal Dave's cushion, then I'll have another cushion. Um, if I kill my competitors, then I'll have an easier time getting ahead in life. So it's that kind of knowledge. The, the limited knowledge where we're focusing only on the advantages of harmful conduct without recognizing the harmful effects, the harmful side effects. So this is, this is a fool's knowledge. Uh, it's that one-sided understanding that leads to making harmful choices, that leads to making unwholesome or unproductive choices. Dhammapada verse 73. pure karan kusu ava se sucha is puja parakule sucha. A fool seeks reputation, preeminence among monks, dominion in households, and honor among other families. Um, so a fool seeks these things because he doesn't recognize that they're ultimately useless. They're pointless. They have no value. It's not worth seeking honor and fame and renown and power and control because these are not the true source of happiness. They're just temporary conditions. So true happiness is attained through non-attachment. True happiness is attained through uh, renunciation, through non-clinging, through letting go. Not through honor or fame or renown, but rather it's attained through, through relinquishment. Through relinquishment of any sense of ownership or identity. Dhammapada verse 74. Mameva katamanyantu kehi pab bajita uho. Mameva tevasa asu kitcha kitche su kismachi. Kitibala sasam kapo kitcha mano chavadati. May both monastics and lay people think it was done by me alone. May I be in control, determining what is and is not to be done. This is the thought of a fool. Desire and conceit grows. So this is quite similar to the previous verse. So just indicating the way that a, a foolish person gets caught up in uh, the desire for recognition. So uh, again, that's all based on conceit and arrogance. Like, may they think I am awesome. May they think I am wonderful. So that, that sense of uh, self-attachment, of self-importance. Um, and all that does, once again, is 
it inflates our self-attachment. It inflates our obsession with self, which as I mentioned earlier, is the root of all our suffering. Um, so all we're doing when we build up our arrogance and conceit is building up our suffering. We're just mirroring ourselves deeper and deeper in misery and uh, misunderstanding. That's all we're doing. We're just digging the, digging the hole deeper instead of finding a way out. Dhammapada verse 75. Anya hilabhu panesa anya nibbanagamani eva me tangabhinyaya heko buddhasa savako sakkarang nabhinandeya viveka manuru haye. Knowledge is the cause of gain, knowledge leads to nibbana. A monk who is a disciple of the Buddha understands just this. He does not delight in acclaim. He devotes himself to solitude. Um, so again, what is, what is knowledge? And knowledge of what? And what are we using knowledge for? So again, there's the knowledge of a pool. So just understanding how to manipulate the world to give you some temporary satisfaction, some temporary pleasure. But there's also knowledge of the cause of suffering, knowledge of the nature of delusion, knowledge of the practices that lead to the dissipation of both. And it's that kind of knowledge that's really worth pursuing and developing. It's that kind of knowledge that's worth perfecting and putting into practice. Because it's in that way, by uh, devoting ourselves to internal reflection, to consideration of the nature of our own mind, uh, that we're able to let go of uh, all of our afflictions, all of our self-afflictions, uh, and to, to move in the direction of uh, genuine happiness, uh, to move in the direction of uh, true wisdom and understanding, to move in the direction of enlightenment, uh, which is the ultimate goal of Buddhist practice. So that's all I have to say tonight. Let's see how much time we have left. We still have a couple minutes if there's any questions or comments. Unless I just intimidated everyone. <laughs> questions? I know, after listening to the words of the Buddha, it's incredibly difficult to say anything. <laughs> because we know it's always going to fall short by comparison. <laughs> Um, but it's through discussion that we can deepen our understanding. Um, so really, I highly encourage uh, asking questions. Yes, please. Um, I was wondering, like, when you talk about benefiting yourself and others around you, what if that's in a contradiction? Because of whatever it is, you know, you're around people who are not the same spiritual level, not as a child, but your family or something like that. Like, how do you, like, how do you benefit yourself? Well, first off, remember that when we talk about benefit in Buddhism, we're talking about what leads towards enlightenment. So keep that in mind first. Um, and then after that, we have two, uh, actually multiple ways of answering the question as to what you put first. So from the uh, perspective of the Theravada Suttas, normally the, the explanation is you start by developing your own wisdom, developing your own understanding, uh, so that then you are in a position where you're better able to be of service to others. So if we're completely caught in greed, hatred, and delusion, we're not going to be of use to anyone. We've got to start to put our own mind in order before we can be of much benefit to anyone else. But then the truth also is that as we work to benefit others, as we work to alleviate the suffering of others, then we're cultivating compassion and we're diminishing self-attachment. So that also uh, even as we're benefiting others, then we're also benefiting ourselves. Uh, we're working also at developing the qualities that lead towards enlightenment. So that's more of the emphasis that's put in the, the later Buddhist work. So um, what came to be the, the basis of the Mahayana schools of Buddhism, that emphasizing of um, stepping outside of one's self-focus and considering how can I benefit others as a way of strengthening my own practice. So both of these approaches are, are equally valid. And in fact, when we look deeply at them, we realize they're not distinct. Uh, they both work together. They're both based upon the same principles of developing uh, wisdom and compassion 
And actually, even wisdom and compassion are not two separate things. It's, a, uh, it's different aspects of the same principle. Does that answer your question? No, I mean, it's something you can reflect on as well. Yeah, well, well, that's the other thing, is that uh, every situation has many details and particulars, which are difficult to account for in an encyclopedic way. Um, so it's, uh, each of us needs to reflect on the circumstances we're in and to consider, what can I do that accords with my deepest intention, my deepest intention of moving forwards in life? And then, as long as we make sure that we're always in line with that intention, then things will work out. We'll move in the direction of enlightenment. It's only when we get off and we start to think, well, actually, I'm more interested in money right now. Money is more important than enlightenment. That's where we're going to run into some problems. Or, well, I want fame. Then we're going to run into problems. But as long as we remember that our ultimate goal is enlightenment, and that every action, whether it's physical or mental, every action should be pointed in that direction. It will always turn out okay. Okay. Hi. Um, is there uh, anything you talk about in people who experience uh, karma immediately? They do something bad and uh, it backfires in the very time? Yeah, well, um, that can be a immediate result of what they've just done. Uh, or it can also be a residual uh, a residual effect from something they've done previously. Yeah. So, again, we talk about karma in terms of one-to-one -one correspondence, which is technically true. However, there's so many different things happening in any given moment. So it's less like this simple one-to-one -one line, and more like a vast web of interrelating conditions. So it's not always easy to pin down exactly what karma led to what result. But the overall principles which karma operates by are much easier to grasp and understand. And that's what's really important, because that's how we shape our decisions. We shape our decisions by our understanding of the principles of karma, not the specifics. You don't need to know the specifics. Okay. Maybe one more question. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for the talk, by the way. And um, could you tell me why the Buddha went to India but not gin and tonic? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> tell me why the Buddha wants me to give up my gin and tonic. You, there was a spot where intoxicants came up, and so for me that read as alcohol or booze. Or yeah, so, those are definitely intoxicants. <laughs> right. So, why, why does the Buddha want me to give that up? Well, in a very simple sense, what happens when you consume intoxicants? What happens to your mindfulness? It diminishes. What happens to your self-restraint? It diminishes. What happens to your wisdom? It diminishes. So since mindfulness, self-restraint, and wisdom are such core, critical aspects of Buddhist practice, why would we do something that damages them so directly? That's a simple answer, why? Enough? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're out of time for the evening. Uh, so thank you all very much. Um, and.